Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour. This is your host, Bill Frezza. Today we're going to explore the issue of privacy, and in particular demands that government agencies are placing on corporations to spy on their customers. We've asked a prominent and outspoken Boston attorney, Wayne Bennett, to join us for a drink to discuss how these demands have evolved over the past half century, as spying requests have become both more comprehensive and more intrusive. Bear with us as we head out of the studio for Jacob Wirth's, one of my favorite watering holes in Boston's theater district. It's a place known for its dozens of beers on tap, its German bar food, a giant mahogany bar, and a saloon ambiance that takes you back to the post-Civil War era when the restaurant was founded. Time stands still here. I had my first Guinness at Jacob Wirth's when I was a student 40 years ago, when this place back then what used to be called the Combat Zone. Let's go find Wayne. Will it be? I'll do a Guinness. What do you want, Wayne? Southern Comfort on Ice. Absolutely. Wayne, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So, Wayne, i got to start with the obvious question. Does anybody care about privacy? I mean, if you look at millennials and the way they live their lives on Facebook, you look at even baby boomers, how quickly we give away our privacy in return for a couple of coupons from the grocery store. Is this really an issue that people care about, or is privacy pretty much history anyway? Well, I'd like to think that it's not history. It's true that millennials and all of us have decided as a matter of convenience that we will give up a certain amount of privacy in exchange for what we think we're getting when we access various um, sites. But if Amazon or Google gets to tailor its pitch to me, that's a trade I'm willing to make. It's not necessarily the case that I'm going to be just as happy. I can ignore an ad, but I could be just as happy with them turning over the same information to the United States government. But our employers and our banks have been turning over information to the United States government since the Internal Revenue Service was first created to collect the income tax. We have no financial privacy in, the, in this country. Everybody's gotten quite accustomed to that. Once we leave, give up financial privacy, why is it such a big deal to give up all our other privacies? Well, all right, let's talk about that. Because once upon a time, uh, I think we trusted our bankers. We actually did. I mean, it's hard for you and I to remember that, but we trusted our bankers. Even I was too young to remember that. Okay, but you've seen the movie. It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. And they, not only did they trust George Bailey's building and loan, it was probably the first Hollywood depiction of crowdfunding. In the end, who came to his rescue? All of his loyal customers came to his rescue because they trusted their local banker. We didn't really devolve, I don't think, to I don't trust my bank until 1970 happened and Congress decided that it was going to be able to start taking information directly from banks. This is not through the IRS, just mm -hmm. directly from banks. And importantly, not only take it directly from the bank, but also insist that under many circumstances that the bank not even tell the customer that they're taking the information, which I think is one of the biggest differences between Google or Amazon or Facebook taking my information and the government taking my information through that. Which them. is disclosure. When the government knocks on your door, when the police knock on your door and they say, I'm here with a warrant, I'm going to take your personal effects, you can see what they're taking. They walk out the door. You also know, not unimportantly, that after they're gone, they're not getting what you create after that. So it's limited in time and scope, and it's and it's And you know about it. Yes. It's not secret police. It's police. Correct. What's going on now is we're not learning. We have no idea whether or when our stuff is being taken. And or what? Or what? And and that started around 1970. And it codified by Congress, so it's legal. This is all legal, and the American people have just gotten used to it. And it was challenged. It was challenged in the, in the mid-'70s in a case that went to the United States Supreme Court, United States versus Miller. And the customer said, wait a minute. These are my papers and effects. It's the same as if you came into my house. And the United States Supreme Court said, no, you voluntarily turned that over to your bank. And so we have a right to just take it. And the bank has a right to just say, okay. With no liability. You can't sue your bank for ratting you out. With no liability to you. 
A couple of things happen. I mean, first of all, it's a burden for them to be doing that. And the second thing is that there's a lot of friction that we can talk about, commercial friction that arises when one of your biggest constituencies, your customers, can no longer trust you. Well, if I give information to my lawyer that the government can't come and take it from my lawyer, don't I have an attorney-client privilege with information I share with my lawyer? That's a recognized privilege. What the, what the court said was, this is just a business. You turned over this information. These are bank records. The bank can turn it over. Now, here's one so of the So it's like I put it out in the public square. Yes. One of the, big, one of the many differences between Congress in uh, the 1970s and Congress today is that when that case came down, Congress was incensed. They didn't say, yeah, go, we can get more information. They actually passed a law saying, here are the circumstances under which you can fetch that information, and here are the circumstances under which you can withhold so they drew some lines. knowledge. Congress actually looked at it and said, you know, we didn't really intend did. it to be so broad. Let's draw some lines. They did that. Now, sadly, the lines that they drew, they drew them, I think, in the late 70s. It was about a year or so after, um, after the, the Supreme Court. No, after the Supreme Court case came out, right? They were just unaware until then. If you look at what they insisted on in the late 70s for bank for your bank privacy, it doesn't conform to the Fourth Amendment. A lot less than a, than a warrant can be used to get the information. And there are a lot more exceptions with respect to telling you, the customer, that the information has been procured. And those exceptions, including what they can get it for and how, uh, how little they have to do in order to be able to get it, and the circumstances under which they cannot tell you, all of those have grown over time. All those kinds of things grow. That's just the nature of bureaucracies. What did they use that information for? What made it so interesting to them? Originally, they wanted it to prosecute the mob. So this was an anti-mafia. They were the bad guys. That's exactly correct. So we got to stop the mafia. We'll, we'll all give up a little privacy because it's worth stopping the mafia. And then now it's, you've got to give up a little privacy because we're stopping the terrorists. Well, in between, they expanded it before they got to terrorists. They expanded it to, we've got to get the information because it's going to help us nab drug traffickers. Of course. So they went from war on drugs. the mob to the war on drugs. Now you're up to terrorists. You left out pedophiles. I, that, well, certainly, yes. Okay. That's so, right. I mean, there's a long list of people that the government wants to go after that we have to surrender our privacy so they can find them. That's the justification. Absolutely, although in the case of pedophiles, there's probably less fertile ground for them uh, in banks because they're not big money transactions usually. But okay. yes, I mean, they'll take whatever they get. Now, the interesting thing was when the Supreme Court came out with that case in which they said these are just bank records, there was a dissent, and he's probably not your favorite guy. It was written by Brennan. And what he said was kind of prophetic. This is just this is way pre-internet. Mm -hmm. He said, the problem here is that if you turn over all of this information from the bank to the government, you can paint a virtual biography of a person. Yeah, you know everything you need to know where they and went, where they traveled, where they, where they stayed, what they ate. Yeah, you, you that's could, right. You could build a life story out of that. And he was exactly right. Now, he was in the dissent. He lost. I think, I think Marshall might have uh, joined him in that dissent. And you haven't even read their email yet because it didn't exist back then. Correct. Now you add to that the kinds of, forget the banks, you know, everything I do, uh, where I, if I had looked up directions to Jacob Worth to get here, that's now in some government So, so let me ask, if you're not a member of the mafia and you're not a money launderer and you're not a pedophile, you're not a terrorist, and what did I leave out? You're not a drug dealer. What do you have to hide? Isn't that the argument? What do you have to hide? What do you call that kind of argument? Uh, I'll call it specious. <laughs> that's what I'll call it. Um, it. It's also the case that I really could not argue against the police just knocking on my door middle of the night and saying, no, I don't have a warrant. But since you're not a terrorist and you're not a drug dealer and you're none of these other things and you have nothing to hide, why don't you invite me in and I'll just take a look around. Don't they do that? They do. And, they, and, and if people say yes, they do. Most right, right. And most right thinking, it should be your choice. Right. But most right thinking people say, get out of my house. So roll us forward. During the time in the 70s when the banks were, for, and this was long after you had to rat out your employees about their wages. So well, that's, that's right. so far in remote history that we don't even talk about that anymore. And, Correct. You know, it's just like air. You know. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We breathe it. Yeah. yeah, we breathe it. So we, it's not even a topic of discussion. 
But in the 70s, during that time, there were very strict re regulations about tapping telephones, were there not? Yes. And those have been significantly loosened. And, of course, remember, we're also talking about, you know, landlines only at the time. Right. There were no cell so they phones. Were, they, were, they, were, they were trapping uh, registers is what they were doing. Yeah. And you had to and physically go somewhere and hook wires up to something. Correct. Not only was it some effort on their part, but it was, it was kind of laborious because you were not, right now, as, as we see in the press, government is asking the cell phone providers to do tower dumps. Yeah. Everything yeah. within a clean. particular... Yeah, we're going to vacuum Boston. We're going to suck it right out, no matter who, the good, the bad, the ugly, the drug traffickers, and, and the average And we'll Joe. separate it out later. Yeah. Isn't well, that what yeah. they say? Right. Yeah, we'll separate, and, and the good guys, will leave them alone, and the bad guys, or you know, maybe if you're a tax-exempt organization that they don't like, they'll get information that they can sure. pass on to the IRS, and you could lose your tax exemption. But you're breaking the rules, aren't you? So as long as you never break any rules... And it's not like we have too many rules, right? Well, let me give you. Let's jump to the other end because right. I know. Let, let me let me let me try this because this goes to trust. I'm a lawyer. People call me for advice concerning things that they find delicate. These are commercial transactions, mm -hmm. so they have competitive issues. Some of them wonder if that information got out. What they were talking about to me, mm -hmm. and remember, it's all privilege. Right. Right. They, they worry that they'll be at a competitive disadvantage, that their trade secrets will be destroyed. What's happened in my practice? Well, I can tell you that I do business all over the world. I do commercial contracts that usually involve technology. And I do most of my work on the phone and by email. Do you know what spiked up in the last year, what? half a year? What? People saying, no, how about I meet you? No. Yes. Now... They won't even trust their correspondence with their lawyer to electronic communications. Because they know it's going through intermediaries that absolutely cannot be trusted. So here's what's happening. Just as it, Forget the, fr the commercial friction as it applies to the Googles of the world whose customers are going to stop trusting them, for example. Just look at the, the secondary and tertiary issues. I've got regular clients doing regular business who are now literally wasting money. You could argue all the money they spend on me is wasted, but <laughs> at a bare minimum... The amount of time it takes to set up an actual face-to-face -face meeting with somebody yeah, yeah. and to travel the there whole for them and me, it slows down commerce. I can do tons of deals if I can do them by phone and by email. But if people don't trust that, we're shortening. Well, you're, you're East Germany. You're basically yeah. heading toward living in East Germany where you know that there's no such thing as electronic privacy. And there are large numbers of people who are paid to keep an eye on you. And I guess the interesting thing I want to dr uh, drill down on, because other, uh, the, the point of this discussion, really, when we agreed to chat, was the commercial implications. You know, I have relationships with my vendors, whether they're selling me email, whether they're selling me books online, whether they're selling me any number of things. I have a relationship with them. I exchange information with them. And I'd like to trust my vendors, yes. uh, not just my banker. I'd like to trust everybody I do business with to behave appropriately. And uh, their reputation, you would think, matters to them. When the man knocks on the door and says, we would like you to violate the trust of your customers because I said so, that puts businesses in, some, in a very peculiar situation. How are they handling that? How are they handling that legally? How are they handling that commercially? I mean, that, this, is a, this is a whole new area of compliance, conformance, and liability that businesses have to start worrying about. Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, if, you, if you leave the government out of it for a second and look back at just when Facebook's biggest problem was how are we going to let our users push the right buttons on their own privacy settings and how can we respect our customers? Right. Whenever they made a wrong move, Facebook users rose up as one to smite them down. Yeah, and there was a they, lot of controversy. Absolutely. And they knew if they wanted to keep their user base, the people to whom they're advertising, or their advertisers are advertising, they, they would have to, have to respond. Yeah. It's a real constituency. Now, the government comes and they say, we're going to violate everybody's privacy, and you don't get to respond when they get pissed off. Right. You just have to take it. You just have to sit there and take but, it. But they, can't, they say, just blame us. It's not, it's not your fault. Just blame us. And now you see... Go talk or, to your congressman. Ab no, ab yes, although 
I think Congress is fairly horrified at this point. In fact, there was legislation just introduced by the fellow from Vermont as well as maybe the, the senator from bipartisan. Wisconsin. It was definitely bipartisan. Yeah, it was bipartisan. I saw an R and a D in there somewhere. And it doesn't go that. I mean, it doesn't go nearly as far. It's a lot like the reaction to the Supreme Court case in the 70s. It doesn't go nearly far enough, but it'd be a nice first step. As I recall, one of the things they're trying to do Instead of having the NSA or the FBI or who, you know, whatever three-letter agency we don't even know exists, hoover down the entire communications of the East Coast or the country and store it in a database somewhere, they're asking commercial providers to retain all that data so yes. they can come back and ask for it later. And so they're adding an obligation on these companies to save all sorts of stuff that normally they wouldn't save. It costs money. It creates liability. It creates problems of leaks and risks uh, oh, yeah. of, of disclosure. If that becomes law, what kind of situation does that put companies into? Well, you know, I find this fascinating because Im imposing a another charge on commerce just because you want to spy on a lot of people, most of whom are innocent, is, is really ridiculous from the point of view of commerce. But let's watch what's happening in terms of trust as well. Right up till now, even without this legislation, without the extra retention, mm -hmm. what the cell phone companies are doing and others are doing are saying, look, every time you ask us for data, it costs us money. Yeah. So they're now charging the government to open cases so that they can respond to their requests. So they could turn this into a profit center. They could, <laughs> but, but let's even assume that they were legitimately doing it at cost. All right. More and more of these articles are coming out saying how much AT&T charges versus Verizon charges versus the other guy charges in order to respond to various government requests. The perception, whether it's a profit center or not, by customers is going to be... It's a profit center. Yeah, of course. They can't this, get around They're it. not going to do this at a loss. Why would they? That's right. And, and therein lies the problem because now the, the argument that you raised before, which was an excellent argument, look, don't blame me. It's the government, okay? Right. They're making me do this. All of a sudden, it looks like, well, wait a minute. If it's the government, how do you make money on this? Yeah, yeah. And who, and who, who are you making more money off of, them or me? Yeah. yeah. Who's your real customer? In the end, if, if you're, if you're going to be even mildly capitalist, it seems to me, you want to be able to allow competitors to compete on trust. And the government's making it impossible to compete on trust. Facebook had its issues. Can I sign a separate contract? Them. Is there any way I can use contract law to fix this, to say, I want to, I want to buy the premium service. I'll pay extra, the premium privacy protection service. And when I do business with you, Mr. Vendor, I want to have a legal contract that says, of course, you've got to respond to the government when they subpoena you for information. We're not ever asking you to do that, but you've got to tell me. Can I put that in a contract with you? You can put anything you want in a contract. It's just not going to work. First of all, its baseline is this. I can certainly put in a contract that I don't want you to hand it out to advertisers, and I can make that stick if yeah. I want to. Of yeah. course, what, the, what the most people these days are likely to say is, well, that's fine, but you can't do business with me anymore because my business is telling you advertising. Right. So fair enough. I can do that in a contract, and I can enforce it. When it comes to the government, my vendor can promise to me that he will tell me if he's allowed to. But the government's not allowing these companies to tell you. So you can't, no one will ever enforce a contract that's illegal. They, yeah, they can't even sign the contract to begin with. Well, they can sign it in that case. I mean, if, if it's the case that they're permitted, then they'll get away with it. And if they're not permitted, and that, by the way, that's an additional cost. If they yeah. had to notify you, which would be a great idea, every time the government took your records, that would be fabulous. It would also be very expensive. Wayne, let's go back to the 90s. I remember I was writing for Communications Week at the time, and the CLIA Act was much in the news. This is when the government was asking both the cellular telephone providers and the Internet service providers to put spigots in their networks, digital spigots, so they could be tapped remotely. So someone could sit in Washington, type some, some words on a keyboard, and wherever this information was originating around the country, it would be swooped up and, and put into a database somewhere. Uh, what's happened since then? You know, it went by the boards, and the reason I think it went by the boards is because the Internet had not blossomed to the point that where we all became dependent on it. Mm -hmm. I think it was still, it started in 1994, I think, is when you started to see a real uptick, uh, and, and it, but it wasn't until almost the year 2000 that people started, I'm going to the Internet for everything. So yeah, it, I, it, it slid by. the mass public. Yes. And people didn't realize that those spigots actually got installed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, they talk about it, the secret room in San Francisco 
near the uh, the internet exchange points, you know, there's a handful of really large internet exchange points in the country where all this data is exchanged between different carriers, which is a very, very com convenient place to tap and collect. Absolutely. And there have been efforts, efforts by some to try to refuse. You've seen some, some, uh, some email providers and others literally shut down because they yeah, do not want to come. A lot of it's gone. Yeah. And, and, it, and then when you go, for those who are really concerned about their privacy, who want to use things like Tor, it's a little bit slower, it's encrypted, but encryption turns out to be like radar detection. It's a cat and mouse game. You know, every time better encryption is installed, you're going to slow down the process, uh, and, but at the same time, it's only going to be a matter of time before it's going to get decrypted. But I'll, I'll actually make the argument that that's okay, because I want them to decrypt the data of the guy who's going to blow up the World Trade Center. That's okay by me. They have to put extra money and time and work, and they've got to find that particular individual, and they have to have a cause, and they've got to give a warrant, and I'm all right with that. What worries me more is the hoovering down and the searching of everything, basically on a fishing expedition. Well, and, and encryption will stop that. No, because no. Because it's too costly to go on a fishing expedition. I think now you've got your finger on it, I believe. The, the part that I disagree with your statement is it won't be with a warrant. No, they'll do it. They'll hoover, even from Tor, if they could do it, if they could decrypt it. But then they're going to have to start making some actual judgments. I can't spend the time to decrypt everything I hoovered. So the nice thing about the judgment the is good. Yeah. Yes, the nice the thing about is that is that now we're going to have to use our judgment as to which ones we're going to actually decrypt. And that actually would be a, a fabulous thing if, it, if we got to the point in encryption where the encryption process didn't actually slow us down when you and I are just exchanging emails uh, that are meaningless to the United States government. Right, we, right. we have to take on that extra burden in order to make it hard for the government to say, well, I'm just going to decrypt everything. Instead of just legitimate targets. Correct. Right? And, and uh, whatever legitimate is. To, you know, we'll decide together what that means. And if they have legitimate targets, I don't think there's an American around who would say, look, the same way they stop criminals of all kinds, if you've got probable cause... Get yourself the warrant. Yeah. And I don't care if you present it at my door or you present it to my ISP or you present it to Google. You're entitled to the information. But that goes back to the business issue. If I know that my vendor, you know, whether it's my airline or who I buy books from or where I get my email, is only going to get a subpoena if I've, they have probable cause that I've done something bad, I'm fine because I'm not going to do something bad. Correct. That's right. So, so my relationship is restored. My trust relationship with my vendor is restored because I'm not out. I'm not a mafia member. I'm not a money launderer. I'm not, you know, I'm not those things, and my privacy will be respected. But that's why that rule exists. And people sort of blithely talk about the Fourth Amendment. Even the United States Supreme Court blithely talks about the Fourth Amendment sometimes. But it may help to just hear it, the Fourth Amendment, because that decision was okay. wrong. okay. The decision they made in the 70s was wrong, and it led to where we are today. But here, the Fourth Amendment. Are you going to quote the Constitution to me on the radio? I'm going to quote the Constitution. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now, there's a reason I read that. Okay. Step one is, if warrants were really only meant to protect the stop on the street when empty your pockets mm -hmm. and to knock on my door, we're going to take everything here, then they could have stopped the first phrase with persons and houses. They went beyond that. They included papers and effects. And if they only meant papers and effects that were on my person or in my house, it's kind of redundant. So I would consider my papers and effects to be the kinds of things that I have entrusted to others. In my safe like deposit my box, for example. Maybe. How about my bank? Yeah. Generally. Or even for that matter, if I choose to look something up on Google, I'm trusting Google to use that information for the purpose for which I delivered it to them, namely to perform the search. But there's a counter argument that completely vitiates this. It was written by dead white men 200 years ago, and who cares? Well, I'm okay when people level accusations at the drafters. Okay, I'm absolutely fine with that. 
But they were kind enough to leave as a provision for that, amend the Constitution. And if the, if the will is such, the will of the people is that this is poorly stated, then the answer is to change it. And there's a process for that. Mm-hmm. But until that day, and you can say, look, these were all dead white guys. Which they did when they passed the income tax. Yes. They passed an amendment. Absolutely. They said, you have no more financial privacy. We are allowed to make sure that your employer has to rat you out. And, and any time you exchange money with someone else, they've got to report it. We put that in the Constitution. That's correct. When the will of the people is such that a change is required, and granted it is relatively infrequently because it's got to be a big deal, it happens. Let's look, though. We're stuck with it. And by the way, so is the United States Supreme Court stuck with it. Not only does it apply to persons, houses, papers, and effects, but how do we get from there to a tower dump where the warrant has to particularly describe the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized? Particularly described, not generally described. Somewhere in Massachusetts, there's a criminal. Yes. Right? And, and we might be able to find it if we get all this data. That's true. That's absolutely true. That's a true, true statement, right? And, you know, it, it completely writes out of the Fourth Amendment the word particularly, but you're right. And for the, by the same token, they should be able to, if there was a crime in my neighborhood, there's no reason why, by the same reasoning, the police cannot come to each and every one of our houses looking for that weapon and search my house for a weapon because there was a crime in my neighborhood without a warrant. That's the functional equivalent of a tower dump. And you know what? If it were being done like that, instead of through corporations, if it were being done in a way where somebody literally knocked on your door and said, look, I don't care, I don't have a warrant, well, then the people coming, would know it's happening and they, they could know respond it's happening. and they could call their congressman as opposed to putting the burden on companies. Correct. So we've got and five then, and companies. And then taping their mouths shut. That's right. We've got a few companies who are writing open letters saying, please change this. But do you think it would be a handful of companies if, if literally there was a knock on your door every few nights because you're, you're living in the wrong part of town and they want to be able to search for a, a weapon that might have been discarded in your property with no warrant? We'd be changing the law instantly. Because it would be visible. Yes. And, and so to me, the single most pernicious part of these sweeps, besides adding enormous friction to commercial transactions, is that it's being done in secret. Now, now, we know about it, but we don't know when it's us. And there's a huge difference. Me knowing generally they might be getting your emails, frankly, doesn't bother me, right? (laughs) Me knowing in particular that they're taking my emails really pisses me off. And if enough people felt that way and were aware of it, then, then the government would have to respond because that's what democracy is for. Exactly so. Yeah, so they're subverting it. The, the Washington Post recently revealed uh, that the FBI has found a way to turn your, your laptop camera on uh, yes. and observe you without, uh, without lighting the little light that tells you the camera is on. I mean, this is 1984 come to life. It is. And it seems to have disturbed a lot of people, though. although the way I understand the technology, the only way to make that work, they have to slip some malware into your laptop uh, ahead of time, just like the, the spammers do or, or, or others. Talk about that a little bit. Has there been any law that gives the government the right to slip malware onto your laptop? I mean, that's the first act they have to do before they turn your camera on. In that particular case, yes. But once they actually invade your personal smartphone, they are, even today with the lax rules, they're treading on thinner ice. And, and the, the, the comparison is to tracking an actual uh, suspect, a real criminal suspect mm-hmm. now, not you or me, tracking a suspect's uh, whereabouts. It's fine to follow him on a public road. Mm-hmm. It's fine to use a lot of other things in order to track where you, like, like the fact that you used your easy pass today to mm-hmm. get from here to there. I, I, again, you're kind of moving into the, uh, the realm of using a third party third corporation. Party, yeah. But the courts have had a little trouble with literally slapping a GPS device under your fender. Without a, without a warrant. Correct. There's a new device now that actually shoots out of the front of police cars with a spike in it. If they're doing a hot chase, it's actually pretty fascinating. So they're doing a hot chase, which is very risky to the public, right? You're chasing some guy at 90 miles an hour through sure. the streets. So they shoot this thing t- into the bumper of the car they're chasing. Then they back off. And then the cook thinks he's evaded the police, but he's running around with a, with a GPS receiver in his back bumper. There's no time to get a warrant. There has always been, even, let's go back to knocking on your door, okay? It had, there has always been an exigent circumstances exception to the, to the Fourth Amendment. So if literally a crime happens on your street and police believe, they honestly Hiding believe in your basement. that he ran in your door, 
They do not need a warrant to come into your house. Yeah, yeah. And that's the same thing. And, and by the way, I had not heard about the sort of dart they could do, but it always occurred to me, going all the way back to the slow speed chase for, you know, O.J. Simpson, <laughs> you know, that honestly, the only reason you're in a chase and creating all this danger is because, not for nothing, you're chasing him. So why not just call ahead? <laughs> right, you know, right, what, right. what is the point of actually creating more danger? In this case, they're actually limiting danger, taking advantage of exigent circumstances, which is fine. And I have no problem. They're not with shooting it. every bumper that passes on the Jersey Turnpike. Correct. Yeah, that would be a different deal. That would be that would be more like a tower dump. The idea of using malware broadly, which I understand they do uh, in foreign espionage, and certainly Suxnet was all part of that. Sure. And you know, more power to them if they if they want to yeah, do that over there. Absolutely. I don't think there are any constitutional issues with that. But using in many malware cases, broadly, no constitution. Right. Yeah. Sure. So what ha- so what happens if they go to the cell phone maker or the laptop maker and they say? It's too cumbersome to distribute malware. We want you to build this into every laptop you ship. I mean, we're already asking you to build a spigot into all of your internet switches. Why not put a spigot in every cell phone and every laptop that I can sit in Washington and flip a switch and I have access to it and put that burden and make it illegal to sell laptops and cell phones unless they put that in there? Why shouldn't we expect that to happen next? I can think of no reason why that wouldn't happen next. The longer we let this go on, the longer that... And it's going to be up to us, not necessarily the companies. The longer we let this go on, the more likely it is that one after another company, including those laptop and cell phone manufacturers, are going to be literally caught in the middle with no recourse. And I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but but that's exactly what's going to happen. Because we're not putting the brakes on. Nobody in Congress is saying, look, or even the courts, is saying this stuff is beyond our constitutional protections. And as bad as it is when you impose it on individuals, it's even more pernicious when you're imposing it on companies. Blanket. And not even, blanket. And, and not even telling the people whose information you're getting that you're doing it to them. To get back to companies for a second, once again, it would be depriving companies of the right to compete. Of all the things that but companies Don't all regulations for. do that. That's true. But if you ask any CEO what he wants when he interacts with his customers, besides getting their money, is he wants them to trust him. Look at the chairman of, of what was it, Lululemon. Don't do no evil, right. Who I mean, just uh, resigned. He, he was kind of a bore. But in the end, he had a bunch of people who were buying his clothes who no longer trusted him to be somebody... He wanted to blame his customers for a faulty product. Mm. Well, when you start doing that, you lose trust. I think every single business in this country depends upon trust in order to have a business. Well, you know, there's, there's, there's some famous books. In fact, there's one called Trust that was written that compare high trust and low trust societies and the amount of friction that's created in creating large-scale businesses. And in fact, in low trust societies, you can't have large-scale businesses. You can only have family-run businesses. And, and mafias, because that's the only way you can enforce trust. Uh, if you're trying to create a, an economy in which you can trust strangers and you can trust contracts, that's a very different kind of law, and that's a very different kind of culture. And I guess the point you're making is we're risking that. Oh, it's absolutely in peril. I mean, we, we've, we've often sent people to other countries who are trying to create systems where the rule of law can really enhance commerce because as you point out you can now broaden the sphere of people you can trust because not because you want to go around suing somebody but because at least if trust is breached there's a remedy if i give you a hamburger today i really will get the money tuesday exactly Exactly. it's no longer a cartoon (laughs) exactly we do that and the only reason it works is because the rule of laws is is respected now Look, for example, the, still the number of people today who, as attractive as China is as a, um, as, a, as a demographic to sell to, because, I mean, my God, I mean, it's Go coming up. Them. Yeah, look at that. Well, there's lots of them in there now. Yeah, they, there's going to be some money. money. The, the problem is we, we've still got a lot of companies who deal primarily in intellectual property who still won't go there. And they won't go there for exactly the reason that you point out, that I can't depend on the rule of law to enforce my rights. So there's no reason why, after I sell the first widget into that economy, that it won't be ripped off 
and sold by others. No, I know. Yeah, because no, and I'll tell you, I we invested in a in an encryption company, and one of the very early applications was helping a multinational chemical company, I won't name, setting up manufacturing in China, because they found out that as their emails and information were flowing through the Chinese internet network, their formulas, recipes, and and uh, and intellectual property was being siphoned off and being handed to domestic competitors. And the only way to protect themselves was to put this encryption in, which was great for our company because we got to sell them encryption gear. Fabulous. And it cast aspersions on, on, uh, on Huawei, which is one of the companies now that uh, we're trying to block from selling uh, switches here in the United States. My understanding now is that there are countries in Europe that don't want to buy gear from Cisco and other American manufacturers yes. because they're concerned that there are back doors in there that will let the NSA spy on their commercial information. Absolutely. I mean, and there have also been articles now that are, that are right after all these revelations have come out that have said, look, you know, there is, there is a burgeoning business in cloud services. Mm. And that is in peril. They're still making money. People are still going to them. But now it allows other countries to actually compete on... Secure cloud. On a secure cloud. Yeah. I'll put the cloud in the Cayman Islands. Why put the cloud in, in, uh, in right. Maryland? Well, you don't even want your company based here because yeah. the request comes into your company and they don't care where your server is. Right, so right. the big opportunity actually is for Western European countries in particular who are offended, even though they probably do the same thing themselves. If the revelation hasn't happened, they can say, look, you can put it here and it'll be secure. So until a Snowden-like revelation comes out, they will have a competitive advantage over United States companies. Didn't the Swiss try to do that with banking? And how, they long did. Did that, and how long has that lasted? It lasted a long time, Back actually. It, it yeah. lasted hundreds of years. A lot of people lived and died very rich. But it's gone now. Oh, Swiss, well, okay. Swiss banking secrecy is gone now. That's true. So what makes you think that cloud secrecy would, would have any different effect than Swiss banking secrecy? Let's be clear about the distinction. It, it, is, it is simply not the case that the United States government can call up the, any Swiss bank or the Swiss government and say, I'd like to hoover all the um, uh, uh, account all the information. information. You can't do it. You know, they there's tried. a very long pro Oh, yeah, of course they'll try. There's a very long process uh, a government has to go through in order to extract relatively modest information. And, and you know what? That's fine. But it, it involves something that's very warrant-like. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. But it's a lot easier to just put a backdoor in the Internet switch. Correct. Yeah. And so long as we let them do it, they'll do it. And the companies can't do much about it. So do you think we're going to be hearing more from Mr. Snowden as this uh, as these revelations come dripping out in terms of particularly in terms of commercial uh, you know commercial violations? The, the problem he's in, and I feel for him. I think he did. I think he did something that was actually laudable, although you can quibble with how he did each individual piece of it. But the line that, that he has to draw is where do I cross the line to being seditious? Because yeah. we all acknowledge that there are very legitimate reasons why the United States government wants to intercept some messages. The question is, how do they go about it? Yeah, he doesn't want to give up actual names of people. He doesn't want to, he want to compromise foreign assets like the CIA is always right. Uh, right. Uh, worried right about. about. Yeah, people die if you do that. But let's look at the other end of the spectrum for a minute, not to go too far back in history, but we have a very long history of anonymous communications. It's a storied history, and some of our heroes have communicated anonymously. I and 